Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the latest in the HDSA research webinar series. I'm going to give everyone a couple of minutes to file in and then we'll get started. like folks are still filing in. We're just letting people come in and then we will get started with our speakers. All right, looks like we've, we're starting to get stable numbers here. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the HDSA Research Webinar Series. I am Leora Fox, Assistant Director of Research and Patient Engagement at HDSA. I am also here with Dr. George Yorling, Chief Scientific and Mission Officer, and I'll be introducing our speakers shortly. Today we'll be hearing about a clinical trial called Connect HD, which is testing a drug that could potentially treat chorea, the movements associated with Huntington's disease. And I just want to run quickly through a couple of slides to let folks know uh, how to ask questions and how to access this recording afterwards. Uh, so we're going to answer questions after the presentation, but you can send a question in at any time using the little chat function uh, in the toolbar. So you can type in your question, hit send, and only HDSA and the speakers are gonna be able to see your question. And we will um, ask our speakers all of the questions that we can get to afterwards. I also want to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on HDSA's website and HDSA's YouTube channel. So you can go to hdsa.org and click this little YouTube button at the top, um, or you can go to hdsa.org slash research webinar so you can share this or you can access it again. And we usually have those up within a few days. So now I would like to introduce both of our speakers today. We have Dr. Erin Fur Stimming, who is an associate professor of neurology in the Department of Neurobiology and Anatomy at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston McGovern Medical School. She received her medical degree from the Chicago Medical School in 2003 and did her neurology residency and movement disorders fellowship at UT Houston, where she became an assistant professor of neurology in 2007. She's the founder and director of the HDSA Center of Excellence there, has been named a super doctor by Texas Monthly and a top doctor by Houstonia Magazine, and has received awards for her teaching of students and residents and fellows. And Dr. Daniel Klassen is chief of the Division of Cognitive Disorders and an associate professor of neurology at Vanderbilt University. He's a neurologist specializing in the care of patients with neurodegenerative disorders, including HD. He earned his medical degree from the Medical College of Georgia and completed his neurology residency training at the Mayo Clinic and postdoctoral training at, at the University of Virginia. He's a past recipient of the American Academy of Neurology Clinical Research Training Grant, and his work is currently funded by the National Institutes of Health. He's the director of the HDSA Center of Excellence at Vanderbilt and the editor of the HD Insights publication that highlights HD research. And both Dr. Klassen and Dr. Furstemming are the principal investigators of several clinical trials in Huntington's disease, including the study we'll be hearing about today, Connect HD. And uh, I will hand it over to Dr. Furstemming. Thank you so much, Leora and George, for having us today. We're thrilled to be here to talk about Connect HD. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll, I'll share my screen. I have a very brief PowerPoint just to kind of introduce everyone to, to Connect HD, make sure we're all on the same page. And then we'll be excited to hear um, from all of you um, any, any questions that you might have um, and we can have further discussion about Connect HD. So I will share my screen here and we will get started. So 
let's start with the basics. What is Connect HD? Well, Connect HD is a double blind randomized placebo controlled clinical trial um, studying the effectiveness of a medication called valbenazine to reduce uh, Huntington's related chorea. We're also studying, of course, the safety and tolerability of valbenazine in individuals with Huntington's disease. So I feel fairly confident that all of you watching today um, are, are um, aware of um, Huntington's disease, um, what Huntington's disease is, um, and what Korea is. But just in case there are some folks that are, that are joining us that are maybe new to HD, I'll just, just briefly define HD. So Huntington's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that's generally referred to as, as a, a triad of symptoms. So motor symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and psychiatric symptoms. Everyone manifests uh, Huntington's disease in different ways, but the most common motor symptom is something called chorea. Um, chorea is defined as an involuntary movement. Um, generally, the movements flow from one body part to the next. Um, and this is, as I said, probably the most common uh, abnormal movement in um, an adult onset Huntington's disease. Uh, chorea can mean different things for, for different people, but um, we, I often hear from my patients that, that have chorea that may be bothersome or troublesome, uh, that they are having a tough time with fine motor movements, that they're dropping the dishes, say if they're doing the dishes or they're dropping their phone, they're dropping things more frequently. They might even have trouble with walking um, and uh, trouble with balance. So chorea, like I said, can, can impact um, individuals in different ways, but it certainly can be problematic. And that's why we're trying to, to address chorea um, with Connect HD with this study. So um, I'll move to the next slide here and just define the, what, what this means. What is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial? I'm sure you've, you've heard um, uh, about uh, clinical trials. There are different types of clinical trials, different phases of clinical trials. Unfortunately, we're all too familiar with, with the different phases of clinical trials after hearing about the various COVID vaccines recently. Uh, but this is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, which means that the research, this is a research study that allows physicians and scientists to answer questions, in this case about uh, Huntington's related chorea, and to determine whether or not the study drug is in fact effective. So double blind means that neither the participant, uh, the study participant, nor the study team will know um, whether the participant's receiving the study drug, which in this case is valbenazine or placebo. Randomized, um, as, as you can imagine, means that the assignment to placebo or valbenazine will be made randomly, just like the flip of a coin. And then the placebo is an inactive compound that is used to help us better determine whether or not there are differences between the placebo group and the study group, because we do know that there can be a placebo effect. Um, and, and so we wanna make sure that we are uh, accurately uh, assessing the effectiveness of the, the study drug and comparing it um, to a placebo. So I've mentioned valbenazine a couple of times. What is valbenazine? Valbenazine is actually a medication that's already FDA approved. Valbenazine was FDA approved back in April of 2017, but it was not approved for Huntington's disease. It hasn't been studied yet in, in individuals with Huntington's disease. Valbenazine was approved um, for a condition um, called tardive dyskinesia. Um, and this is a condition in which individuals have involuntary movement. So they can look um, in, in some ways uh, like the chorea that we see in our patients with Huntington's, but, but tardive dyskinesia is, is different. Often, uh, most often tardive dyskinesia is the result of taking a certain class of medications. So valbenazine is approved under the trade name Ingreza. Uh, valbenazine is uh, thought to work directly in the region of the brain that's important uh, for, for uh, uh, contributing to involuntary movement, um, an, an area in the brain called the basal ganglia. So as I've mentioned already a few times, we're studying now valbenazine in individuals with Huntington's disease to see if we can make an impact on chorea. As we all know, all medications, um, whether they be um, prescription medications or even over-the-counter, can potentially have side effects. So it's, it's always important that we're aware of those potential side effects. Um, the most common side effects from valbenazine, and this is not an all-inclusive list by any means, but the most common side effects that have been reported from the other clinical trials that have been done in individuals um, uh, with tardive dys dyskinesia, for example, um, the most common side effects have been drowsiness, tiredness, and sedation. 
So feeling, feeling sleepy. Again, these are not the only side effects, but these were the most commonly described side effects from patients that took valbenazine. So a little bit more on Connect HD. Who can participate? Well, we are planning on enrolling 120 participants in Connect HD. Um, we are enrolling individuals between the ages of 18 and 75 years of age. Individuals that can participate in, in Connect HD must have a diagnosis of motor manifest Huntington's disease, and they really need to have chorea that's troublesome or bothersome um, so that we can better assess the effectiveness of, of the study drug um, in, in hopefully decreasing the chorea. Of course, individuals that participate need to be willing and able to comply with the study instructions and the procedures. Connect HD is a relatively short study, actually. Um, the, the duration of Connect HD can be is, is pro approximately 18 weeks. It can be up to 18 weeks. Uh, four of those weeks are actually the screening period. Um, uh, and then there are 12 weeks of study drug dosing. And then there's a final study visit two weeks after uh, the last dose of the study drug is, drug is given. And of course, as I've mentioned, the study drug is either valbenazine or placebo. So there's a total of nine study visits. There's a period um, within that 12-week period that's the dose adjustment period. So this is when uh, individuals will be asked to take a higher dose of the medication, um, assuming they're tolerating it well. And that, that could be either the placebo or, or valbenazine. And then there's a period um, called the maintenance phase where participants will be on the same dose of the drug um, so that we can really better assess its effectiveness. The study drug is administered orally. And, uh, and the study drug will be provided at the study site. So participants will be asked to, uh, to take the drug at home on their own, um, and ideally in the presence of a caregiver. Uh, that, something important to mention is that valbenazine is only dosed once daily. So participants will, will be asked to, uh, to take this medication, the study drug, only once um, per day. At the conclusion of this trial, the study team will analyze the data and, and hopefully we'll be able to determine to answer the question, is valbenazine most importantly safe and well tolerated in individuals with Huntington's disease? And is it effective or effective enough in decreasing Huntington's related chorea? So that is our goal um, in, in uh, pursuing Connect HD. The study is actually taking place um, throughout the US and Canada. Um, it, currently at 46 sites throughout the U.S. and Canada, um, potentially uh, up, up to 55 Huntington study group sites. There are multiple websites that are listed here. Um, I, I hope that you're all well, well aware of the HD Trial Finder. Um, this is a great resource for finding uh, trials that, you might, uh, that might be a good fit um, for you on the HDSA website. Um, you can also view the connecthd.org site along with, of course, clinicaltrials.gov. There is a toll-free number listed here, 1-800-487-7671. And this is, uh, this is a number to the Huntington Study Group. Um, and these individuals can help uh, give you more information if you're interested about Connect HD. So most importantly, I'd like to thank our HD patients and their families. I'd like to thank you all for listening um, to this brief presentation about Connect HD. We are so grateful to the HD community for participating in research. Even if it's not in participating in Connect HD, um, these clinical trials help us learn more about HD so that hopefully we can find more effective treatment strategies moving forward. So we are very, very grateful to the HD community uh, for their work and participation in clinical trials. I'll stop sharing my screen and now we're, we're happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Furstening. Um, so I'm seeing a couple of questions come in. And someone had a question about um, where, where do participants have to live? And I think you, you mentioned that there are uh, different study sites and I have posted some links to um, access those, those study sites. Um, but maybe, um, I don't know if you're able to talk a little bit about um, kind of the distance to study sites. Sometimes we get questions about you know, whether somebody who's 
20 miles away versus 100 or 200 miles away can participate in the study? Yeah, that's a great question. And I will also um, let my, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Clausen, answer some questions as well. I'll stop rambling. But, uh, but, but we, we do recognize that, that there are many individuals that might not live right next door to a, a study site. Um, and, but we want to make sure that, that individuals that are interested in participating and that do qualify for the trial can participate. Um, and so the, uh, the, the sponsor, along with the Huntington Study Group, um, can, can assist individuals that are interested in participating. Um, they can assist in finding a site uh, near them um, or relatively near, and they can assist with transportation um, as needed. So please don't hesitate to reach out to any of the, the sites, the Huntington Study Group, um, or any of the sites that we've listed if you have additional questions. I have a, another question for you all coming in. Um, it relates to uh, potential exclusionary criteria. At, you, you did not, in your slides, um, Aaron mentioned whether or not patients could have major depression and participate in the study. And, and folks may be familiar with tetrabenazine and do tetrabenazine where they're contraindicated again for patients with major depression is giving them that this drug valbenazine is in a uh, similar class as those drugs. Is that going to be the case for the Connect HD study? Right. So Daniel, would you like, Dr. Clausen, would you like to answer this or would, would you like me to answer? Yeah, sure, I can. Uh, you're doing a great job, Aaron. That's, Thank I'm you. Sorry to interrupt. Keep it going. Um, yeah, so um, interesting question about depression. Uh, I would probably say the first thing is if, if you have depression um, and you have Huntington's disease, then as clinicians, we have a lot of opportunities to help you uh, with, with that depression. Uh, sometimes depression is related to um, the need for medication and we can use medications to help your depression. Other times there's needs for counseling or kind of services that may help you manage a chronic neurodegenerative disease or you know other issues that may arise. So, so the first the way I'd answer that question is that um, you know if you have symptoms of depression then, then as clinicians we want to help you and we want to treat it in the way that we should. That being said if you have um, depression that needs to be treatment treated, then of course, being enrolled in a clinical study may not be the most important thing for you. We would want to treat your mood symptoms. But second, if you have been treated for depression or on stable medications for it, then potentially you could be enrolled in this study um, as, a, as a candidate um, because, you know, it does allow for patients to be treated um, for depression, and that's not exclusionary. Um, that being said, one of the issues that does arise with this study that, that we need to be aware of is, is concomitant medications. So if you're taking a medicine like an antipsychotic, like for instance, you've heard of things like Haldol or Olanzapine or uh, Aripiprazole, those kind of medicines are, are contraindicated because we really want to assess how this medicine works for Korea and those medicines can also alter Korea. So that, that is, there are some exclusionary medications that you need to be aware of. So I'd, I'd, I'd add that little bit of color to my answer in that, you know, when, the, when you see the study team, they'll look at not only your mood, but also your medications and your clinical symptoms and really come to the decision of, is this trial the right trial for you? And um, that's part of that relationship that you build with the, with the teams that you visit. And thank you for that, that answer. I would absolutely agree with everything Dr. Clausen said. Um, we, and, and George, as you pointed out, I didn't mention in the, in the slides that, um, that, that valbenazine is very similar um, to the two medications that are already FDA approved to treat Huntington's uh, uh, related chorea. That, so tetrabenazine and dutetrabenazine are the other uh, two medications, the brothers or the cousins, whichever way you wanna look at it, of valbenazine. Um, and so this is a similar medication in the same class, but different. And as Dr. Clausen said, um, it, it's, uh, the good news is we do have effective medications to treat the symptoms of Huntington's disease. And so we have effective medications to address depression and, and other non-motor and, uh, and motor symptoms of HD. And so in individuals that have 
depression that is well well treated and has been addressed and they're on a stable dose of medication, um, they, they can potentially participate uh, in this trial. Thanks, Dr. First Deming. We've had a couple of questions about uh, location for the trial, specifically about Europe and Argentina. Is this trial only in the United States or do you see it expanding or access expanding beyond that? That's a great question. At this point, the study is only in the US and Canada. Um, and, and so, so likely um, that will, that will um, remain the case uh, for now, but, but thank you for that, that question. We also had another question about kind of, I guess, timing around this trial. And we always get questions about when drugs are going to be available. I know that's a very difficult question to answer, uh, but the question is when, when do you think this drug would go to market? You want me to try? I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't have a, uh, it's, it's hard for me to give a really hard deadline on when things would happen. I would say, you know, there's a process. So we would do this trial and when it's finished, we look at the data and we'd ask the question, you know, did, did our hypothesis, um, did it, was it tested? Then the hypothesis is that valbenazine will treat HD related chorea. And so we'll first ask that question. And if it's true that it does improve chorea, then we will um, present that data and then go to the FDA to say that we believe that this medication has, has helped patients with chorea and we would like to um, bring it to, to patients. And so that process can take um, some time and there may be iterative questions from the FDA to the to the company and, and vice versa. And, um, and then the medication will be approved. So how long that takes um, depends on a lot of things, depends on how soon we get the trial completed, how soon the results are presented to the FDA and how soon the FDA responds and, and gives um, a, a clarification or a label change for, for their, for the indication. And um, so it's hard to say, but I, I can definitely say that the sooner we get patients in this trial, the sooner we'll have an answer. And so we, one of our goals with this talk is to get people talking to their friends, to their loved ones, to their cousins, to their, you know, friends who may have HD. And if you have a, if you have chorea and it's not treated, find a site near you so we can finish uh, enrolling this trial to get that answer and move towards other options for patients who have Huntington's disease. Yes, absolutely. And we hope to complete enrollment by the end of May. Uh, so we, um, we are moving along. And so I would echo um, what Dr. Clausen said. If, if you or your loved one has bothersome or troublesome Korea, please, please reach out. Um, we would love for you to participate. Another question uh, for you both is, is how does valbenazine or how is it hoping to differentiate itself from the other two approved drugs for chorea, detrabenazine and dutetrabenazine? Erin, you had mentioned that uh, this study will involve once daily dosing, which I, I believe I'm not familiar. I'm pretty sure the other drugs are more than once, uh, multiple doses per day. Is that the only way that it's differentiating itself? Right. So that's, that's a, a great, really important question, actually. So, you know, some might say, well, we already have similar medications approved. Do we really need to study a medicine? And I would argue, yes, we need to continue to search for, um, for new um, uh, treatments um, for, for the symptoms of, of uh, Huntington's disease, both the motor and the non-motor symptoms. But um, so to answer your question, um, so valbenazine is dosed, as I mentioned, once daily. Tetrabenazine is dosed uh, three times daily, uh, and, and dutetrabenazine, otherwise known as Ostedo, is dosed twice daily. Um, and so because of the, the pharmacology of, of the medication, we're, because of, of uh, the way valbenazine is made, we um, 
uh, uh, subjects only need to take this, this drug once daily. Um, and the nice thing about the, the, the pharmacology of, of this medication um, is that, as I mentioned, it's relatively well tolerated. By no means am I implying there aren't potential side effects because we know every medication has side effects, but it's relatively well tolerated because there aren't kind of what we call a lot of peaks and troughs throughout the day. So um, uh, individuals that take this medicine generally um, tolerate it well. And we've seen that from the other clinical trials um, uh, that have been done in using valdenazine. So it is similar. Um, and it's, as I said, it's in the same class, um, but it's, it's, um, there are some, um, some, some aspects of this medication um, uh, that, that make it unique. It's, it's a very um, a powerful VMAT2 inhibitor. Um, and so it really um, is, is effective in, in um, uh, working on the target on VMAT2 um, and maybe a bit more selective than the other medications that are available. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions about uh, cl other clinical trials and participation, um, as well as other drugs. So it, it sounds like a person has to have untreated chorea to participate in this study. So being on a drug like tetrabenazine or dutretrabenazine, also known as Osteto, would probably exclude them from participating. Um, but uh, there's someone who's wondering if a person is already involved in another clinical trial is it possible to participate? And if someone does decide to participate and is eligible to participate in Connect HD, how long afterwards might they have to wait to participate in another clinical trial? Do you want me to try and handle that? Sure. I, mean, I can start. I mean, I think so to answer the question um, specifically, I'd say that um, participation in a trial is an agreement between you and the um, study team through the informed consent uh, that you're going to, you know, see if a therapy, you know, has a clinical effect. If we're talking about clinical trials that have uh, medications. And so because of that, you know, it's, it's rare to have patients involved in multiple clinical trials at the same time. There are some exceptions, like sometimes you can do what's called observational studies where, you know, you're looking at say how you perform on a certain cognitive task or how you perform on a certain motor task and you may get some information that way, but, but it's very rare if ever an experience where a person would be involved in two therapeutic uh, trials at the same time. And largely that's because whenever you're involved in a trial, there is some potential risk and some potential benefit uh, to, to you when you're getting a, a, a substance that may be in one case a placebo, in one case could be an investigational therapy. So, so to, to answer the question, I think we do hesitate on recommending uh, per people to be involved in multiple clinical trials. So, so I, I, I think you, you, once you're in a trial, you're in that trial. Now, when it comes to this medication, um, once the trial is completed, um, there will always be specific um, recommendations for participation in another trial that will be put in the protocol to guide the, the answer of the question, when can I do a next trial? So for instance, if you were in a trial that exposed you to a certain um, therapy that reduced mutant Huntington, it may not be in your best interest to be in another trial that reduced mutant Huntington because there could be, you know, different risks or different uh, ways of interpreting the data that that would make you, you know, not make that trial not the right one for you. However, you know, it's very customary. We have a lot of patients in our clinic that have done one trial and it's finished and they've done another trial because it's asking a different question and the amount of time between um, the trials is, is, is um, appropriate given what the study sponsor has outlined. So it's not a never say never, never, you know, never say always issue. It's really dependent on the trial, where you are in Huntington's, where, what the trial is trying to do. But, but participation in Connect would not to my knowledge, preclude you from further studies 
uh, or further clinical trials with Huntington's disease. Uh, the only um, issue is, is really timing, like when the trial's over, how long you stay on the medication, and when you want to go to the next trial. And I uh, absolutely agree. Um, the, the nice thing about Connect HD um, is that it's a relatively short trial, as I mentioned, up to potentially 18 weeks in, in total. Um, I did not talk, we haven't talked too much about Connect HD 2, which is the open label extension. So Connect HD 2 um, is available to participants that have participated in Connect HD. Um, after they've completed uh, Connect HD, which is the, the placebo controlled part of the trial, the active part of the trial for, like I said, up to potentially eight weeks in, in to 18 weeks in total, um, they will have the opportunity and the option to move over uh, to the open label arm, which means that everyone receives the study drug. Everyone that participates receives valbenazine. There is no placebo arm. And so this is a longer, the open label extension is, is a longer trial, um, less frequent study visits, um, but still assessing the safety and tolerability of, of valbenazine. I'm going to put myself on mute because that was my next question for you. Was there going to be an open uh, label extension for this study? Well, thank you. Yes. Yes, and it's it's currently underway. Yes. We have a rare scientific question about valbenazine's mechanism of action. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about VMAT2 and why that helps to calm down that might help to calm down movements in HD? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So I, I didn't spend too much talk, time talking about, um, about the mechanism of action. I, I mentioned you know, the basal ganglia, which is an important part um, of, of the brain for us as movement disorder docs and for our patients that are struggling with, with involuntary movements um, or maybe not even, maybe even the movements that slow down. And so this is an area in the brain um, with there are various circuit, circuits in the brain um, that, that help determine um, uh, when and how we perform our movements and how quickly or slowly we perform movements. Um, and so there is a neurotransmitter, a neurochemical uh, called dopamine um, that is thought to be important in both hyper and hypokinetic movements or too many or too little movements. And so um, there are other neurochemicals also um, that uh, are, uh, are in the, the nervous system that are important and that, that impact mood and movement. Um, but, but dopamine is really important um, in, in hyperkinetic movement disorders and, and hypokinetic movement disorders. So VMAT2 um, is, is the target for valbenazine. And as I mentioned, tetrabenazine um, and dutetrabenazine. Um, and, and we think that um, because of the selectivity of, of valbenazine and inhibiting VMAT2, we are able to um, decrease uh, the release of dopamine and other neurotransmitters, but importantly, again, dopamine um, into uh, what we call the synaptic cleft. And so the, the short answer is that we, we hope that these medicines, we think that these medicines um, uh, decrease dopaminergic activity um, within the basal ganglia um, and then it, uh, therefore suppressing involuntary movements. So it's sort of a, um, it, there, there's a, a good bit of conversation I think we could have about VMAT2 and then the neurotransmitters, but that's sort of, a, I think, a, a relatively short answer to give you an idea as to kind of the mechanism. And um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a, an illustration. Um, I think it helps to kind of look at, at the, the neurons um, and, and uh, visualize the, the uh, VMAT2. Uh, but but, um, but ultimately, it's, we think, uh, important that we modulate uh, the, the release of, of uh, the neurotransmitter uh, dopamine. Feel free to, to add on or make that a bit more clear, Dr. Clausen, if, if needed. Yeah, I think you did a good job. I mean, I think the easiest way to think about it is um, it modifies presynaptic dopamine release, and in Huntington's, um, that release appears to be related to chorea. So when you, when you reduce presynaptic dopamine release, it seems to help chorea. And so this medication class kind of helps with that. Thank you, everyone. I don't know. One, one more question that just okay. came in. 
And I think this is kind of similar. related. It's a similar question of if somebody were to go on the open label extension, um, would that keep them from being able to enroll in other clinical trials? And I think it's probably a similar answer that it's rare to have two overlapping drug trials at the same time. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it also maybe add a little bit of nuance that it depends on the trial that you're looking at. Um, you know, I could think of exceptions to where if someone's on a drug that's already been approved for the FDA on an open label on a known dose that there may be certain trials that they could be involved in, but I could also think of others that they couldn't. So, you know, never say never, never say always. But, uh, Another question just came in about whether a doctor's diagnosis of chorea is needed to participate in this trial. That's a really good question, actually. Uh, so, so a diagnosis of, of motor manifest Huntington's disease is required. Um, and so in, in order probably to receive that diagnosis, you would need to see a, a, a neurologist or maybe a, a primary care physician uh, that you know, was aware of, of um, your, your neurologic exam and maybe your family history. Um, and, and once the, the whether it's the, the primary care physician or the neurologist, a uh, healthcare provider performs a neurologic exam, um, likely they will, um, they will identify if in fact you do have chorea, they will identify that you have chorea. And so once, um, once a, a practitioner um, identifies chorea, um, then they will um, be able to help in, in um, giving you information about treatment options or clinical trial options. So, so it, is, it is important that you're, you're evaluated by um, a, a physician or um, a healthcare provider um, to determine whether or not you, you do in fact uh, have, have chorea. Um, and, there, and, and if you do have chorea, if it is bothersome or troublesome that it's effectively treated, whether it's using the medicines that are already approved or uh, participating in this clinical trial. Dr. Fersimming, I believe that we have um, answered all of, all of the questions that have come in. Um, I do see that someone asked a question about a different clinical trial, and we're going to focus today on, on Connect HD, but you're welcome to reach out to HDSA at the webinars email, and we can um, either answer that question or enlist the help of, of our speakers today in, in responding to you about that. Um, so with that, I think we're just going to thank our speakers once more, Dr. First Stimming and Dr. Claussen. Thanks for, for your expertise and your time today. And again, we have, we have posted those, those links um, to where you can find the study sites and you can always go to hdtrialfinder.org to learn more about all of the trials that are, um, that are ongoing. So thank you very much and uh, have a great day, everybody. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank thanks for having us, George and Ligora. Have a great day. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. Bye.